Hey, fellow strongpreneurs, this is Tom Reber from MotorHard.com and the Strongpreneur Podcast. Today, I'm excited to share a interview I did with Mr. Vernon Lavia. I grabbed my computer and my microphone, and I went to his office about five minutes from my home, and we sat down a few weeks ago and had a conversation that I'm bringing that to you today. Uh, Vernon has started over 20 corporations in his career and two nonprofits. Uh, he's owned uh, Martini and Cigar Bars, Pizzerias, Coffee Shops, Pen Manufacturing Company, Insurance Agencies. Uh, and he, he's also the owner of a defibrillator company uh, that has equipment in uh, many places around the United States, including places like O'Hare Airport in Chicago. What you're going to hear in this interview is just gobs and gobs of wisdom coming out of a guy's mind who's been in the trenches and been a great leader for many, many years in the business world. And so I want you to just kick back and uh, listen to this conversation that we have, because to me, it really meant a lot to get some time with Vernon alone like this and pick his brain. Uh, one thing I really hope that you, you really, that you catch from this interview is how we are able to choose the exact type of business that we want to have. Okay, we really have a, a power of choice uh, if we focus on the right things. And that's really what I felt he drove home for me as I just sat there and listened to him share his wisdom. So uh, without further ado, welcome Mr. Vernon Lavia to the Strongpreneur Podcast. Podcast. That was weird how I said that. Appreciate you carving out some time to hang with us today. Uh, if you could, uh, maybe tell us a little bit about who you are and about yourself, and love to hear it. Sure. Right. Well, first, let me thank you for your energy, your inspiration, and uh, thank you for serving your country in the military. Thank that's you. something that's just really great, and I want to want to thank you for that. Um, as we discussed, uh, I've opened twenty different corporations, and also two nonprofit you know corporations, mm -hmm. and I, I throw that in because. The elements are very similar, and uh, many mm -hmm. folks in the nonprofit world don't realize that, that 80% of the elements are identical, whether it's a pizzeria or, you know, a nonprofit. I have opened 20 different corporations and everything from uh, Martini and Cigar Bar, and I don't drink, uh -huh. um, and uh, Pizzeria. And, do you eat uh, pizza? I do eat pizza. All right, there you go. And uh, these days, gluten-free, though. And... Uh, I've opened six gourmet coffee and sandwich shops. Um, we've had a wedding and, and uh, event banquet hall, a pen manufacturing company, uh, two different uh, companies related to finance, loaning people money in mm -hmm. essence. And, um, and the one that I'm really involved in, oh, and also three different insurance agencies, different kinds of uh, insurance agencies and approaches, and uh, my defibrillator company. So um, I represent a defibrillator that is now at O'Hare and Midway airports, you know, deployed them on the walls. So our yellow and, and uh, black defibrillator is being seen more and more all over. There's about 350,000 out there now. And I have a little distribution company that I love to be a part of that whole, you know, that whole thing out there in the world of saving lives. Yeah. So that's just a little bit about the, the companies that I've started. And how, how did you... Uh How'd you first get into business? What was your first one and how'd you get there? Well, sure. So it really starts with um, what I call making the sacrifice. Making the sacrifice, I came out of Duke University. I had been Navy ROTC at Duke and I had some great professors. So let me first of all say that almost nothing I say today, almost nothing is an original idea. Mm -hmm. Nothing. Don't credit me. Credit the people who have talked into me, uh, coached me. I mean, just credit them. The reality is, is that as hard as it was to hear a good Duke economics professor say, you should go out, get a job, tough it out, learn, grow new muscles, mm -hmm. get some muscles, but great, have that vision of going out on your own someday. But don't go out on your own without muscles. And so I toughed it out for 15 years. I did uh, five years each at three different Fortune 100 companies. And my last role for my last three years was managing $1.2 billion department uh, and a 100-person, $44 million budget. And I got there, you know, in, in 12 years. Hmm. And I got there by implementing what my professors had said. 
just get to your job, look what others are doing in your job, whether it's at your company or others, and do just a little bit more than them. That's all it takes. If you, if you take the top person, I was at Prudential, my first job. I started networking with Cigna reps, Metropolitan reps, Hartford reps in the same industry because we're all calling on the same insurance brokers and consultants who are placing our business, right? right. Yep. What's the formula for success in that industry? Find out who they think is tops and outdo them by just a little bit. Hmm. Not by this imaginary, huge, enormous amount that you don't even know if you don't analyze it and go see who your competitors are. So it comes down to, it comes down to understanding your competition. And with an eye on someday, I'm having my own businesses. Every day, I would wake up for 15 years and realize this is all toughing it out, getting new muscles, sweating it out, because I am going to have my own corporation someday. I don't know what, but it's going to be something. So, as you're talking, it reminds me of somebody who's got a goal to go to the Olympics and they're training for yes. 10, 12 years, and they just know that their time is going to come, and right. you're just putting in the work to prepare yourself. And um, so, twenty or over twenty businesses. What has been one of your biggest surprises about growing a business? Well, I guess the the first thing is, um, in that fifteen years at the Fortune one hundred companies, I, I gained true business acumen because I was up to the game of gaining business acumen. I could have been up to the game of just selling more than the next guy, mm -hmm. making more money. Those could have been the games I decided to play. But the game I decided was, what is truly good business acumen? And if that's the game you're playing, then while you're toughing it out at a job, you're going to look at your the middlemen who are selling your product and say, who's doing the best from a business perspective? You're going to look at your end clients. I was meeting with CFOs, presidents of corporations, 50 to 5,000 employees. And I was analyzing, well, what makes them good? Oh, I got a 500-employee company here on the verge of going out of business which hurts us if I'm writing their health insurance. That's what I was in, health insurance. Right. Well, why are they going out of business? I'm meeting with the CFO. Let me ask them. You know, let me learn from that. Mm -hmm. If I hadn't been up to that game, I would have just been talking claims and claim ratios and premiums and, oh, they're going up 16% this year. Gee, mm -hmm. too bad. But I was up to the game of learning business acumen. So the biggest surprise was, and I was taught this, I didn't want to believe it when an economics professor told me, so I had to go out and learn it with muscle. Mm -hmm. 80, about 80% 80 of every business is exactly the same. Whether you're making pizzas, whether you're making caterpillar giant you know, mm -hmm. earth movers, whether you're, you're consulting in the internet marketing world, 80% of that business is still the basic business acumen of, of hiring, firing, mission, vision, marketing, advertising, competitive analysis, accounting. 80% is the same. Mm -hmm. Where I see most small, I'm sorry, small businesses failing is they think their expertise is the 80%. They think the thing they're doing is the 80% of the business. They think the pizza, oh, that's 80% of the business. And they hate and sweat through what they think is only 20% of the business. And then 85% of pizzerias fail. Hmm. So I've opened 20 corporations, 19 have made money. So I've broken, you know, the, the rule of 85% failure rate, right? Yeah. Well, I don't take credit for that. I open it knowing from day one, working it kind of backwards, mm -hmm. how's it going to make money and how's it going to be successful? So take my defibrillator business, for instance. I could have I chosen, the word choice is a very key word. You choose or decide. Decision is sitting there and making a list of pros and cons and pros and cons, and then you make a decision. Well, what's that? Just choose. Just decide. Just decide. I'm going to have a defibrillator business with one employee, and I'm going to set it up in this way. Mm -hmm. And and so I have 75 distributors around the country. None of them are employees. And I'm going to set up in this way because I choose to. I could have chosen by now today, 14 years later, I could sit here with a 147-employee company mm -hmm. and a lot of real estate bills to pay and a lot of overhead and a lot of stuff and there would be nothing wrong with that I have no doubt I could have been successful that way if I had chosen but I chose that I would rather have the ability to go I'm a bird watcher for 45 years it's my hobby it keeps me sane I'd rather not have all of that as a causing friction 
Yeah. So that's friction. I'd rather have the most pure, the less friction possible. And there's nothing wrong with having chosen if I went the friction route. Nothing wrong. Yeah. But the biggest surprise that I got was this concept of, wow, 80% of these businesses are all identical. They all involve the same elements. And if I really want to sit there and go, when I had a pizzeria and say, it's the pizza, mm -hmm. no matter what you try to do, you're still going to have... You're still going to have three or four people on Yelp say it sucked. Right. No matter what you thought, but here you put 80% of your time into the pizza and only 20% of your time into the business acumen, mm -hmm. the operations, the fundamental concept of business. And understanding your numbers and the just... Just uh, understanding the numbers, working yeah. you know, working on your business and uh -huh. not in it. The classic book, The E-Myth right. by Michael Gerber. Uh -huh. <laughs> so many people fail to see that, no, I didn't join. I've been on over 20 boards of directors of nonprofits and uh, two different for-profit boards. I didn't do that to have it on my resume. I didn't do that just to, you know, to build. I did that because I was a true guerrilla networker. Mm -hmm. And by the way, I was called a guerrilla networker in 1998. Now it's become all the rage. I, yeah. Nobody said guerrilla networker. Somebody at Mesero Financial in 1998, I'll never forget. One of the top guys there, old and crusty, you know, in his 60s, maybe even 70s. And he goes, you know what you are, young man? You're a guerrilla networker. And what's guerrilla networking? It isn't just meeting somebody, taking their card, and sending them a note today, an email. Great to meet you. Let's follow up sometime and have a coffee. Right. Guerrilla networking was, how do you find something that speaks into their life? How do you improve their life? Uh, yesterday, I guerrilla networked by, by connecting somebody to the roofer who I trust completely. Hmm. A roofer. I just heard they need a roof on their house. It may never sell a single defibrillator right. or any form of insurance. Mm -hmm. It may never do that. But, but boy, they instantly responded with such thanks. I have already contacted the roofer. Thank you very much to get this third-party outside opinion because uh, our neighbor's a roofer, and he had given us the quote, and we're trying to like find out how do, what do we do here. It's very awkward to have a neighbor give you a roofing quote. Mm -hmm. I'm, I heard that challenge going on in their life, and that's how I followed up. Yeah. And so that's just a little piece of what is guerrilla networking. Well, guerrilla networking is a key fundamental thing that one of my biggest surprises in business was how terrible people are at networking, how cumbersome, how bothersome they become. They become incredibly bothersome and they don't get it. They don't realize yeah. that you know, you're not getting any points for sending me a two-line email mm -hmm. and then just clearly trying to make money off of me. Right. I mean, just clearly. Yeah. And that's what I feel, you know, most people are missing. They haven't gained that muscle. And again, I'm not taking credit for having invented that. I had some great people. I constantly try to grow. I read tons of books. Um, Zig Ziglar, Brian Tracy, Tony Robbins, you know, back mm -hmm. in the 90s. I went to every single time they were in anywhere near me. If I could drive three hours or closer to get to see them, uh -huh. I would go every time. Um, and I would really listen to what they're saying. And so they really grew me mm -hmm. into that ability in the year 1999 to make the leap out of corporate America. Say, okay, I've done 15 years here. I've done really well. I lived my life way below my earnings. Right. So now I can come out and I started my first six businesses in two years, six coffee shops in two years, without having to take a dime of money from a bank without having to worry about what most people do. Oh, oh, how do I get the capital? I got these great ideas, but how do I get the capital? Yeah. Well, during those 15 years, I averaged probably about 150,000 a year, maybe 200, somewhere in that range. And I lived my life below 100,000. Yeah. Still an amazing life in America, particularly as a single guy most of those times, right? right? right. I mean, I got married in 1992, so I had a long run of a single guy making a lot of money. I could have pissed it away. I could have, yeah. you know, thought that this was important to have the nicest car and all this other stuff. But no, I had my eye on the end game, which was I want to be able to be my own bank. I want to be able to open my own businesses. Mm -hmm. I'm not quite sure what my passions are yet. But I'm going to develop a muscle and de develop sort of a world view yeah. and then get out there and open my businesses. And the one thing in common is that I learned from the Zig Ziglar's and Brian Tracy's was to have a life plan and a business plan. Hmm. And I see so often that that's missing in the typical entrepreneur. No life plan. Have you ever struggled with uh, getting your worth from one of your businesses? 
your own your own self worth. My own self worth. How do you mean? What do you mean by uh, that? I see a lot of people that tie their identity to their business, and if, and the way the business goes, they go. Ah, I see. Yes, you know, that makes sense. Yeah, I've never had that worldview. And again, I yeah. thank a professor who said the worst thing you can do is go out and open one business, live in that business like it's your life, mm-hmm. and in the end of a typical 30, 35 year business run, yeah. you're gonna find you had 10 good years, 10 break even years, and 10 losing years. Mm-hmm. And losing might be a divorce and a kid who won't talk to you. Right. So losing isn't necessarily just money. But his point was, he told me, I'll never forget this, that professor at Duke, he said, um, if you buy a stock, say you buy you know Chevron stock, and somebody walks up to you and says, here's two bucks more than it's worth today on the stock market. Are you gonna hold on to it? No, every business you ever start needs to be something that if somebody walks up to you and says, hey, I want your business, and here's what I'm willing to pay for it, you need to be 100% open-minded 365 days out of the year. Uh So by having that foundational thought, no, I've never fallen into that trap, never. Even in my defibrillator business, which was started after my dad died in my arms. So you might think, wow, that's one you're emotionally attached to. Right. No, two years ago, I sold 75% of it to a guy who came forward and said, boy, I'd love to have your network of distribution. Mm-hmm. I said, okay, you could. <laughs> Instantly, first words out of my mouth. Yeah. I go to people all the time and I try to talk about, hey, you know, are you, are you willing to, no, I'm not going to sell my restaurant. Wait, wait, really? You don't even know what I want to talk about. And you, uh-huh. you have this closed attitude of, no, I'm not going to sell my restaurant. Well, how could you and then two three years later they're out of business you know they're not there anymore there's a for lease sign in the window and it's like uh, rats I wanted to go and acquire them into my network of restaurants yeah. and they wouldn't even have a conversation with me so no I don't feel even in my defibrillator business where I'm passionately tied to it because of the death of my father I'm about saving lives and I do it in honor of my father right. and I don't have to own you know my company's called Defibrillators Inc. I don't have to own Defibrillators, Inc. To, ha- to be able to achieve that mission. If someone else can achieve it on a grander scale, then they're saving lives and honor my father on a grander scale than I chose to do. Yeah. So, you know, that, that's really how it comes down. So I haven't found myself defined uh, by any of my businesses. There's a, certainly a theme here that, that I'm catching with everything that seems to come out of your mouth, and it's about choices. Yes, and choose that we we have the opportunity to um, build ourselves intentionally mm. if if we choose to. And so you touched on uh, Zig Ziglar and Tony Robbins and things like that. Um, one of the questions I did want to ask you was, how do you work on you? Yeah. Well, it is a constant. It is a constant um, for me. It's reading, mm-hmm. and so for me, it is books. Like right now, I am I am rereading. A, a classic book, The Digital Economy. I don't know if you know this book, but The Digital Economy um, came out in 1995, and Don Tapscott wrote it, and he is still considered one of the foremost thinkers in this. In 1995, you got to keep in mind that this book came out just months after the first internet search engine, Netscape, mm-hmm. came out, okay? And he predicted what would happen and almost all his predictions have come true, almost all of them, based on how the digital economy, the internet, would link people together in such a way that would form you know, business, in such a way that you couldn't even fathom it. 1994, it was rare to see somebody holding a cell phone. Right. And if you did, they were a brick. They were the size of a brick. Um, it was rare to find a company that had put a PC on everybody's desk yet, where I was. Um, at Aetna in 1993. That was the first time we put PCs on people's desks. 1993, the very first time. 1986 was the first fax machine we got in our office at Prudential. I mean, just to put this in perspective, 1986. This guy's coming out writing this in 1994, just eight little years later, after the fax machine, and he's saying that the digital economy is going to connect nations, it's going to connect people, it's going to create... You know, gross domestic product growth, unlike the planet has ever seen. But he also pointed out some possible pitfalls, you know, of what can whether it was privacy issues and things we're dealing with mm. now today. He saw that 25 years ago. So he came out with a, a, a new edition in 2005. So the first edition, 1994. This is 2005's edition. I'm rereading it. 
I believe that you have to constantly ask yourself um, the following question. What am I doing different this, what will I do different next week that I'm not doing this week? And uh, people at Aetna Insurance laughed at me when I had my manager's meetings and they knew I would ask that question every week. <laughs> we met every week and I would ask that question every week. They knew it was coming. But every week I said, what are you gonna do different next week that we didn't do this week? And that, that is sort of at the foundation for me of innovation. Mm -hmm. uh, it's so easy. The typical sales rep wakes up tomorrow and does the same thing he did the day before. Mm -hmm. And so on and so on and so on and so on. The typical roofing company does the same thing. Yeah. So on and so on. But if you ask yourself, what will I do differently? By asking that question, when we had one gourmet coffee shop, I put on a suit and tie. I went to meet with the provost of a university. I mean, something that had never happened before. He even said, no pizzeria has ever come and met with me. Hmm. Instead, what they do is they illegally come on our campus. They hire college kids to put flyers on cars. We call them and say, stop putting flyers on our cars. And it becomes an adversarial relationship. You've come to me, put a suit on, and the first words out of your mouth is, you'll never put, you'll never put advertisements on any of the cars on campus. Those are the first words out of your mouth. The provost said, I'm listening. Mm -hmm. What do you want to do? Long story short, we were able to send out uh, 6,000 flyers tucked in an envelope that went out to all 6,000 students. And in that, it had a Aurora Pizzeria card that said, buy five pizzas and your sixth one is free. Hmm. And all I had to do was print up the 6,000 flyers, which was 2,000 sheets of paper cut in thirds yeah. to stick in an envelope. That's all I had to do because I asked myself that question. What am I going to do different next week for my pizzeria to survive? You know, from my pizzeria, La Via's Pizzeria, how's it going to survive? What am I going to do? And, and asking that question, I think, is, is at the root of your, the answer to your, to your question. You know, how do I work on me? Well, when I ask that question, invariably it makes me work on me. Mm -hmm. I got to read a new book. I got to reread The Digital Economy. I got to reread The E Myth by Michael Gerber. Mm -hmm. I got to reread. Uh, a Whole New Mind by Daniel Pink. By the way, those are three books I think anybody wanting to be an entrepreneur yeah. need to read. They yeah. just need to read The E-Myth, A Whole New Mind, and The Digital Economy. Those three books, to me, along with the Bible, <laughs> are a foundation for anything is possible. Just in those books. I know people say, oh, you got to read this, you got to read that. To me, you can, you can have almost anyone read those three books mm -hmm. And if they have a good life plan, including their spiritual and faith life, mm -hmm. they're going to be able to achieve whatever they want. They're going to decide, gee, do I want a two-employee roofing company or a 40-employee roofing company? Choose. Just choose. Don't sit there and sweat it out. Just choose. Am I going to open one restaurant or three? Yeah. Well, I hope you choose three because <laughs> the one formula is, is a formula for failure. Yeah, choose what you want instead of taking what you get. Yeah, and choose what you want instead yeah, of taking what you yeah. get. Yeah. Don't sit there and over-decide stuff. Yeah. And, um, and, and, and I should have started with it's founded on the principle of, it's a very humbling principle. We all have less than 1% of the world's total knowledge in our brain. Yeah, this is exactly where, where I wanted to go. Because before yeah. I hit record today, we started getting into this um, uh, developing our mental muscle and and that stuff. So let let's talk about that. You know, okay. you're, so you and I are sitting here for you guys are listening to this, and you, you talked about you usually draw something for somebody. Explain what you. What you so draw I usually on. draw a circle mm -hmm. and say, okay, this circle represents all of human knowledge. That's seven billion dead people estimated, and seven billion people alive today. Fourteen billion people, all of human knowledge. If I were to draw it in a pie chart, yeah. I draw a circle, and I ask the person I'm meeting with, usually in my very first meeting in the very first 10 minutes, how much of this human knowledge do you have in your head? And almost everyone takes a pen and makes a dot. They make a dot on this circle. There's been a couple exceptions. A couple attorneys, a couple superintendents of schools have told me they think they have 2% of the world's knowledge. <laughs> and yes, that is very laughable. Yeah. Because... Instantly, no matter what anybody says, it's easy to prove that no one can mention much about the 10,000 species of birds on the planet. What do they eat? Where do they nest? Are they nest 20 feet off the ground or 3 feet off the ground? What are their migratory patterns? How about the 5 million estimated things in the ocean? Mm -hmm. 
what was the form of government in what is today Portugal in the year 1362 and who were the rulers and name the ruling party. Was it a serfdom or not? Take every spot on the planet and do that. All that is the collective human knowledge. What's even more humbling is, where do you think you're an expert? Now, I think I'm an expert because I've been told many times in bird watching. I've been a bird watcher for 45 years. And yet, I'm willing to say I have less than 5% of all the knowledge about bird watching in my head. Right. Even though I'm called an expert. I know nothing about the 10,000 species as it relates to their eggs, oology. I know n nothing about 9,500 of them and their migratory patterns and what they eat and how they mate. I only know bird calls of about 300, 340 species that I can imitate. I do bird calls. Can we hear one? That's a house finch. They're singing like crazy right now here in Aurora, <laughs> Illinois, as the males are puffing up their chests and trying to find the females. And this is the height of mating season right now as they fight for the females. A lot like men. Anyway, um, so I'm willing and humble enough to begin everything with that. So if you start with the premise that you have less than 1% of the world's knowledge in your head, why would you think an exercise of decision, which is taking out a piece of paper and writing the pros and cons to one thing or the other, when you have less than 1% of the knowledge in your head and probably less than 5% where you think you're an expert, it's illogical to sit there and decide. Choosing is a completely different art. Choosing is not taking out. It isn't going willy-nilly, but it's not taking out a piece of paper and putting down pros and cons. So if you go and you buy ice cream, are you going to have vanilla or chocolate? Do you make a list of pros and cons? You choose. Chocolate, peanut butter all the way. Chocolate, peanut butter all the way. But you just choose. Yeah. What if you went and you said, well, the last time I ordered chocolate down the street, I didn't really like it. So that's why I'm going to decide not to have chocolate today. Think of how logical that is. It has no bearing whatsoever on the ice cream shop you're standing in right now. And yet our minds tend to want to decide things. Whether it's ice cream, whether it's politics today or issues. We sit here deciding way too much. Mm -hmm. Choosing is a lost art form. Just choose. Just say, I'm going to choose. Now that you made your choice, go at it. Go at it completely. So like I told you earlier, I could have chosen in my defibrillator company to have a model 14 years ago that I set up to have 140 employees by now and a certain amount of revenue by now and all that went with it, all the friction yeah. that would go with the traditional model of setting up a corporation with desks and electric bills and all that stuff. Instead, I chose to have a one employee model 14 years ago mm -hmm. and I chose to have representatives around the nation who are distributors from stay-at-home moms to catalogs that still send out two million catalogs a year and everything in between. Those catalog companies sell thousands of units per year. The stay-at-home mom maybe only 10 units a year. But I speak into, hey, wouldn't it be nice if you could make your vacation money in one fell swoop by selling 10 defibrillators a year? And maybe it's a person who did CPR training for 10 years or it's a person who had both her parents die from cardiac arrest. I find the connection, I don't just pick willy-nilly, mm -hmm. I choose her. I had a guy who wanted to become part of my business years ago, but he didn't do email. I chose not to. And he couldn't understand why I wouldn't let him sell my product. Mm -hmm. I said, there's nothing wrong with what you want. You want to have a 40-minute phone call on a weekly basis. You want me to come visit with you. You want me to come out on sales calls with you. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just not the model I choose. Right. I'm not choosing that. I'm choosing a model with as little friction as possible so that I'm only doing it 15 hours a week. That's all I do my defibrillator business. So let, let's take that example that you just gave, yeah. this conversation. A lot, of, a, lot of, um, a lot of business owners will get sucked into feeling like they have to. Right. I, I have to um, play that guy's game. Not mm -hmm. that he's a bad guy, not that there was anything wrong with him. You know what I'm saying? Sure. Like, how do you, um, how do you avoid that? Feeling like you have to... Uh, differentiating between this is a great opportunity for my business right. versus this goes against what I'm choosing to build. Sure. I would start by saying in the book, The E-Myth, mm -hmm. read the chapter Primary Aim. Primary Aim is so critical to, to avoiding that trap. So Primary Aim, 
you know, we can call it your life plan, you know, what's important to you, um, you know, what is your real mission in life? If it weren't making money, if, it, if making money wasn't important, what would you do? However you want to word it, those are a bunch of ways to word what the e-myth labels the primary aim. So I would say it starts with the primary aim. If your primary aim, and by the way, that can, that can also evolve over time. So 15 years ago when I started my first corporation, my primary aim was, you know, it was very superficial. I'm going to help people in their lives, not necessarily connected to my coffee shops. I mean, how's a coffee shop going to help you in your life? Really? It isn't. But the mission that was hanging on all of our walls and all of our coffee shop was our mission is for you to remember us as a good part of your day. Mm-hmm. I could be serving you mediocre coffee. It still has to it still has to be tasty, right? But if I made it about the coffee, forget about it. You'd be saying, oh, Gloria Jeans is much better back then, Gloria Jeans yeah. or, or Green Mountain Coffee. Oh, they're much better. I'd be in this game that I then trap myself in. If my game was to prove to you my coffee was the best, I just trap myself in the game of, oh my God, my coffee has to be the best. You're trapped. You're inevitably trapped. If you're going to start a, you know, a roofing company, I keep coming to that example yeah. recently because I've gotten involved in having to do many roofs on some of my properties. Well, if you're going to be in the game of, well, I got to beat you in price. Oh my God, now you've trapped yourself in, you got to beat everybody in price. If that's the game you trapped yourself in, well, then you're trapped. So if you trapped yourself in, i got to support these eight employees. i got to do that. Well, now you're trapped yourself into that game. Yeah. So with a primary aim, it really comes down to what is your mission in life? If, our, if at our coffee shops we said our mission was for you to remember us a good part of your day, everything had a flow to that. So we empowered our employees. I didn't have to be there to empower our employees that – if you're seeing somebody not having a good day, and worse yet, if you're seeing somebody not having a good day because something we did, like we're out of chocolate brownies, and they came in and they went, ugh, you don't have a chocolate brownie? Sorry, sir, we sold our last one. And if you stop there, you're getting written up. Mm-hmm. You're not following our mission. You need to then say, sorry, sir, we're out of our last chocolate brownie. However, do you really want chocolate? Is that what you're craving? Yes. Well, I'm empowered to offer you anything else chocolate here at half price. What do you want? Anything chocolate. That's how every employee at our, we had 88 employees at our six gourmet coffee shops. They were all empowered that they had to do that. So in other words, you avoid the trap ahead of time through that kind of following of a primary aim and a mission that we're going to help people in their lives. And it's not really about the coffee. And so... Um, I would say that that is the, the greatest way to avoid entrapment in your business is to stay focused on your primary aim and evolve it. So my primary aim today sitting here is to improve the lives of children who are the victims of whatever situation they find themselves in. Mm-hmm. I've gotten really – I've narrowed it down from, hey, we're going to help people in their life yeah. to improving the lives of children. Of course, children usually come along with an adult. That child didn't choose for their parent to be an alcoholic or an ex-felon or homeless or near homeless or impoverished or you fill in whatever it is. Uh, You know, a double amputee, uh, emphysema sick. The child didn't choose that. So in essence, I am helping the family by focusing all the way down to that common denominator, the child in tow. And anything I'm doing, whether I'm sitting there talking to a manufacturing company last week that bought two defibrillators from me, I had a conversation with the woman that ended up with how she was helping children in Israel where she lived for 10 years and had nothing to do with defibrillators. But I've been to Israel and now we have this thing in common and now she's going back there and I can introduce her to the head of the National Museum of Israel because he's a good friend of mine. And now she can take her kids into the National Museum of Israel all because of that concept of marrying my primary aim with guerrilla networking, yeah. you know, and bringing it together where I'm not sitting there focused on talking about business. I'm talking about their life mm-hmm. and trying to get clear on what is their life plan. So I would say, you know, that's how I haven't defined myself, you know, in this. Yeah. I admit my humility of not understanding 99% of the world in any shape or form. All right, uh, good buddy of mine, Neil, is going to kick me if I don't ask you this next question. Okay. All right, I'm just, as, as I'm listening to everything that's coming out of your, your mouth here, it's, it's awesome stuff. And 
one question that I know Neil and probably a lot of other people will, will want me to ask is you, in the last 15 years, you've had about 20 businesses. Mm -hmm. Okay, 19 made money, one had whatever issues it did. How have you managed to balance running so many businesses? Because myself included, I, I will tell people, focus on one thing at a time, be, you know, hit one nail in at a time is something I preach all the time when I speak and this and that, like you gotta be focused on the task at hand. So how do you, how do you remain focused but also have your hands in so many different things? Sure, well, it kind of starts with my worldview being a jigsaw puzzle analogy of human understanding. So, and that's a treatise I wrote in college, a little three-page treatise on the jigsaw puzzle analogy of human understanding, that everything is a jigsaw puzzle. And yes, that means while you're putting in one piece, you're focused on that piece. Usually you're just holding it between your thumb and your forefinger and you're focused and you're trying to say, where is this going? Right. And you find the home for it or you put it down and you pick up another piece that you think you saw a shape that fit in. So I'm telling you, you can do both. You have to be you have to be strategic at all times in a jigsaw puzzle way. So again, combine this thought of you have less than 1% of the world's knowledge. Mm -hmm. If you take that to the next step, you also don't know less than 1%. Now this is where it gets confusing. In the pie chart, I would draw a slice that's less than 1% of what you know. I would also draw another pie chart, piece of pie, that's less than 1% of what you don't know and now you sit there stymied. Well, what's the other 99%? Mm -hmm. The other 99% you don't even know. You don't even know. It means you can't even form a sentence around it. A minute ago you said you didn't even know there was people. There were people in oology, right? Which are people who yeah. collect bird eggs, study bird eggs. They can identify them by size, how many dots are on them, the color. So, 99% of the world's knowledge. I'm telling you, Tom. You don't even know, you don't even know, and you can't form a sentence around it. I'll give you another example. The mating habit of the calliope hummingbird in Jackson Hole, Wyoming is a phenomenal thing to watch. Now, I could go on, mm -hmm. but I'm pretty sure that I've already lost you and you've already seen that that's in the 99% of what you couldn't even have formed a sentence around a minute earlier. Yeah, you're three or four laps ahead of me now. Yeah, so I mean, <laughs> so, so how humbling is it to know that 99% of the world's knowledge, mm -hmm. you don't even know you don't even know. Like you may say, I don't know calculus. You know you don't know that. Right. You know you can say, I, I know I don't know who was the government leader of Portugal in 1462, and it probably wasn't even called Portugal, but I don't know who the government leader was. So you know you don't know that. But 99% of the world's knowledge, you can't form a sentence around not knowing. The other day it was a, it was a, a college grad who never heard of a quark. And here we are in a Royal Lenore near Fermi Lab that identified one of the quarks, one of the smallest pieces of matter in the universe. Hmm. But as soon as I said that he didn't know quarks even existed, he never heard of the phrase, never knew the word, didn't know there were six of them, didn't know that the, the boson quark, the boson particle is just identified over in the EU, didn't know any of this stuff. What else is a smart college person doesn't know he doesn't know? And the answer is 99% of the world's knowledge. So. If you start with that, getting to answer your question, mm -hmm. you have to be willing to open more than one thing and focus on more than one thing. You have to have that willingness. Otherwise, your jigsaw puzzle will never, ever get connected. You start with the end in mind. Famous uh, architect said that, right. Burnham. So Burnham said start with the end in mind. If you're not starting with a 1,500-piece jigsaw puzzle and then working towards that, then you might just stay stuck and never have more than a 30-piece jigsaw puzzle. Even though in your mind you had this dream of something bigger because all you did all day long was make 100 phone calls to find your lead for your insurance agency. Yeah. And I made 100 phone calls every day. And I kept making 100 phone calls every day. But somehow I never got out there to be on the board of a children's museum. Gosh, I wish I had. And somehow I never got out there to have four agencies because you were stuck making 100 phone calls in your insurance agency every day. You didn't ask yourself, what could I do different tomorrow than I'm doing today? You didn't ask yourself, well, what if I gave away 90% of my profit, held on only 10%? What if I use that formula? Why do I have to get 100% of the profit? I mean, there is a, there is a big eye-opener for most entrepreneurs. Right, right. You know, I give it away freely. Tom, if you identify a defibrillator, you know, a defibrillator prospect, I'm going to give you 100 bucks for each defibrillator I sell. After 10, it's 200 bucks. Mm -hmm. There it is. 
I've said that to thousands of people around the country. I followed up with it in writing. I've put it in emails to those I think were more warm to the, hey, this could be somebody who sells a defibrillator for me. Right. I solidify it and then move on. And then someone in Idaho contacts me. I saw you two years ago on a plane. You said if I could help you with a defibrillator. Is that offer still there? Yep. Okay. My church needs one. Great. Here's your $100 finder's fee after they buy one. It's a very simple process yeah. that is overwhelming to so many people because they're focused on hammering the nail. Mm-hmm. So, yes, you got to hold the jigsaw puzzle piece. you got to place it in. But sometimes you got to put it down and pick up another one and see where that fits in. But you always have to have your mind on it being a circular jigsaw puzzle, not just square, but circular. So there is no beginning and no end around the circle. And you're seeing that 1,500 piece, which is your primary aim and your life aim married with your business plan, and you're seeing it at all times. If you lose sight of that and you get stuck hammering the nail, that to me is the formula for failure. Mm -hmm. Not an organized chaos of the 1500 piece jigsaw puzzle and knowing you're just gonna achieve that. Mm -hmm. I will complete this 1500 jigsaw puzzle. And you can't do it if you're gonna make 100 phone calls a day in your agency every day and that's all you're doing. And yeah, that makes you money. You might end up making eighty-two-five at the end of you know four years, and it's great, and that's a success, right? Mm-hmm. There is a level of success in that. But would you rather be able to be in all these different playing fields, working in, in none of them, but being on them, working on them, driving human beings to them? Yeah. Why? For me, it's to be improving their lives. Whether I can do that with a pen, yeah, a pizza, bigger mission, cup of coffee, and, a defibrillator, and, yeah. yeah. But get clear in your part primary yeah. aim, and it shouldn't be to make money. By the way, I, I hope that's not. Yeah. I, I do need to point that out. I mean, a lot of twenty-five-year-olds, their first thing they write down when they start their company is, "A, it's got to be profitable. B, we need to treat our employees with respect, uh-huh. and C, our customers need to achieve the greatest level of service." I mean, I that's like. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> well, it's funny you picked the age twenty-five because I, yeah. I have a couple more. Literally, I have, I have two more questions, and the the very next one was, what advice would you give a twenty-five-year-old Vernon? So, a twenty-five-year-old Vernon, I definitely was too focused on on gaining money. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, I definitely was. It's, our society is so. Oh boy, I mean, it's so easy to fall into that trap. Mm-hmm. So I would, I would certainly say, ask yourself the next day, what am I doing differently? What am I going to do differently tomorrow that isn't focused on just making money? And if you just keep asking yourself that, you'll help form a primary aim that, that that's, um, isn't shallow, hollow, and vacuous. Yeah. So I arrived at the 30-year-old Vernon, and I felt shallow, hollow, and vacuous. Mm-hmm. I really did. I felt it became very clear to me. You know, I had no spiritual relationship with Jesus, zero. Uh, it was all me, myself, and I. And, man, the, the chances of me really having a significant relationship in my life was even stymied. I was going to have a relationship in my life. It was also organized and planned to, to be working on making the next dollar because I equated that to success. Right. And so I, fi- I find myself here today saying, boy, if you can just learn a way to take ten thousand dollars from 30 different things now all of a sudden you're in an incredible incredible top one percent of americans right only seven percent of americans earn over a hundred thousand a year seven yeah. percent only one percent earn over three hundred thousand per year so as you look at that my goodness it's as simple as where can you get ten thousand uh, dollars from 30 different things in your life mm-hmm. so i'm a substitute teacher Mm-hmm. I have uh, I've been an insurance license guy for 30 years. I mean, insurance license, my God, anybody can just go get one. Yeah. And it and it isn't because I have a passion for insurance. Mm-hmm. I had a passion to achieve my primary aim, which is why I did it yeah. 30 years ago. You know, and so I would say to those 25 year olds, just really check yourself at: Are you getting into habits that are habits driven by money growth? Mm-hmm. And if you get in those habits, just like a bad golf swing. It's going to be really, really hard to get out of that habit. Tough to fix it, yeah. It's going to be tough to fix it. And that little less than 1% of what you know in your mind, it's going to play a game on you, man. And the game's going to be, but this is good. Look, yeah. I was able to take a cruise. Uh, but that, you know, that, that 70 hours a week, 
you know, for, for four months mm -hmm. and, and making 128000 a year was good because, look, I got this great cruise out of it. And you're just playing a game that's kind of kidding yourself. Yeah. It's going to be real hard to, to define yourself as a good dad someday mm -hmm. if you're trapped in having to make that level of money as a function of time. My greatest accomplishment, Tom, is that, um, is that I was able to chaperone every single field trip of my daughters from age four to age 15 for 11 years. I chaperoned every field trip of my two daughters. That's my greatest achievement. I made a lot less money during those years, but I had set up my life to be able to. And it's that kind of planning, I would say to a 25 year old, what kind of husband and what kind of father are you gonna be? What would they write? What would your kids right. and your wife write as an epitaph? Mm -hmm. The E-Myth, by the way, I right. think has is the book that has a great section. At age 25, write your epitaph. Mm -hmm. Write it now. And every year on January 1st, I don't drink, so I don't wake up with a hangover. I wake up at first light, watch the sun come up on January 1st, and I, and I, I rewrite my epitaph. Hmm. What's going to go on my gravestone? Or what would I want to go on my gravestone? I do that. And after I write that, I then calculate my net worth. Not hung up on it at all. Mm -hmm. Some years, it was like, holy cow, I went down $600,000 this year. Mm -hmm. Holy cow. All right, I'm over it. It was a great year. I went bird watching 100 days. Right. I made you know 100 new friends. I gave out 40 copies of the E-Myth. I substitute taught, and this kid graduated and went on and formed his own landscaping business and came back and thanked me for what I taught him in five minutes as a substitute. Mm -hmm. Those are the ways that on January 1st I measure. And so I would challenge that 25-year-old to be real careful about forming money-making habits, to think about what his epitaph is, and write it now, and write it every year. And, and be the best husband and father that you can, even before you have a wife or kids. Yeah. Just create that. Choose it now. And I think that's that's great advice, even if you're not 25. It's, well, right. You know, it's any point. So, absolutely. It's at any point. So, what's um, your last question? You said you had another. Yeah, I got one more, and and, and this kind of just gives gives the ball to you here. You know, we got an audience of, of listeners, uh, or, you know, around the world that are listening to the, this podcast, and what. What final words would you like to share with them to inspire them to be stronger in their life or business that maybe we haven't talked about yet? Well, I would truly say, you know, for me, it's, it's, a, it's a relationship with Jesus that I didn't understand until about 15 years ago. So whether there's a correlation to it being dwarfed in the corporate environment or not, maybe. Um, so that's about right when I left the corporate world and, and suddenly realized, wow, I got to put food on my table each and every day. I got to invent or create a way. Mm -hmm. And I did it in all these different ways, from 20 corporations to insurance licensing to substitute teaching. And I will work myself in to get a, uh, you know, a finder's fee on any number of things throughout the year. I just helped connect a million dollar construction job of a construction guy. And he says, well, what do you want out of this? I said, I don't know, flat thousand bucks. He goes, really? Well, normally it's 2%. I go, no, I don't need 2% of a million dollars. I said a thousand, so that's what I feel good about a thousand. Uh, the other day it was FF and E, you know, furniture and equipment on a project. And the guy said, "What do you What do you want out of this?" I said, oh, "I don't know, thousand bucks." <laughs> it was a two hundred thousand dollar job. I mean, so if you're not money driven, you're not sitting there trying to maximize everything. I literally felt like, hey, I want to give a thousand dollar donation to, mm. you know, the Crime Stoppers. Yeah. Uh, which is where you can call in a tip on a crime. And so my brain at that moment and my life view of how am I helping children. And Crime Stoppers was one way. I was like, hey, I want to make a thousand dollar donation. That's why I said a thousand. And the other, the other one was I wanted to make a thousand dollar donation to SciTech Children's Museum. Mm -hmm. That's why I came up with a thousand. I didn't need twenty thousand on a construction job. That all I did was connect two human beings. Right. That didn't seem right to me. And yet, that's the norm. He's telling me. <laughs> it's like, you're the guy. You put it together. You put the deal together. Mm -hmm. Well. Okay, but I don't see it that way. I just would like to make a contribution to SciTech. Oh, and by the way, you don't have to give me the thousand. You could write the check yourself and say it's you know this is from Vernon Lavia. Mm -hmm. You could choose either way. I don't care. He goes, oh, I'd rather ten ninety nine you and keep it clean. All right, cool, whatever. Mm -hmm. And so you know that's kind of my parting. That's kind of my my parting thought on everybody is have that life plan. Don't lose sight of it. Have it you know foundation and. In, in, I don't care what your spirituality is, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I believe the teachings of Jesus 2,000 years ago are universal. Mm -hmm. But 
there's only you know two billion people out of the seven billion who agree fine you know find the other teachings but really get clear on those teachings you know whether it's buddha whether it's um, muhammad mm -hmm. get clear on those teachings and keep that as part of your life plan so that you have a faith that's bigger than money bigger than possessions bigger than your next you know elaborate vacation to show off to your own kids because you haven't spent much time with them so now you got to get the chalet and spend the extra money and get all the you know all the little fringe things in the end they're not going to appreciate that you might think they are but they're not and as somebody with a 17 year old and a 14 year old you know i feel i feel confident that driving around this country to 38 states with them taking them to 10 different countries but living very you know very um not we weren't staying at the ritz you know we were staying in huts we were staying with people we were staying with people i'd networked with i feel that that is kind of a life plan that um if you set out to live well below your means every day of your life you're going to be able to sit back and say on your epitaph you know i was a great father my kids thought i was a great father my wife thought i was a great husband mm -hmm. and i really helped my community in a way that would never have happened if i just worked 50 60 hours a week in my own business hammering that nail and there's value to that don't get me wrong i'm an economist so i believe gdp has innate value yeah gross domestic product has innate value but boy oh boy it'll be shallow hollow and vacuous and you'll realize it you just don't realize it too late well that's that's awesome advice and um i've had a blast chatting with you today cool i i know i, I know that you're uh the things you shared with us today are, are certainly going to help a lot of people that are listening to this. And, and um, so, again, I just want to thank you for hanging out with us today. And Oh, you're very welcome. Uh, and thank you for what you're doing. And thank yeah. you for the connectivity that, yeah. you know, without that, nothing happens. If humans don't yeah. connect, nothing great happens. That's right. Well, on that note, um, take something that you heard today and do something with it. Does you no know good sitting in your head? Uh, unless you take something and implement it, even if just one thing to help, uh, like you said, ask myself what question every day? What are you going to do tomorrow that you didn't do today? There you go. Have a great day, everybody. We'll see you next time on the Strongpreneur podcast. Do you have one last bird call for us as we get out of here? The screech owl. Love it.